This lesson is on area and definite integrals. This is going to be one of the longer videos we have. We're pulling together a lot of ideas to really lay the fundamentals of what is calculus. So there's going to be a lot of information given to you at the beginning of the video that may not make a whole lot of sense as to why I'm giving it to you. It will make sense as we get into the toward the end of this video and into a couple of the later ones. So we're going to discuss the concept of area first. There's going to be a lot of review from geometry, your high school geometry courses that is, and we'll pull things together from there. So bear with me. First thing we need to talk about is summation notation. Uh, the sum of the first n terms of a sequence, a sub 1, a sub 2, a sub 3, all the way out to a sub n, is given by this notation right here. The capital Greek letter sigma, which is the large letter there, indicates a summation in mathematics. It's telling me to sum all of the numbers in the sequence a from i equals 1 all the way to i equals n. So if a sub 1 is the first element of a sequence, a sub 2 is the second, a sub 3 is the third, that symbol tells me to add those numbers together. So i is called the index of summation, and any a sub i value is called the ith term of the sequence. Let's look at a couple of examples. This is fairly straightforward, although the notation kind of makes it look a little bit more complex than it is. So for instance, let's say I want to compute this sum. So the sum from i equals 1 to 5 of i. So i is effectively a function. So what we're saying here is each term, a sub i, is just equal to whatever i is. So a sub 1 is just 1. a sub 2 is just 2. a sub 3 is just 3, and so forth. Now this tells me from the top of my summation that I'm going to go from i equals 1 to 5. So i equals 1 is my start value, and whatever's on top of that symbol sigma is my ending value, which is 5. All this is telling me is to add the numbers from 1 to 5. So 1 plus 2 plus 3 plus 4 plus 5. Simple concept. The notation makes it look more difficult than it is. So add them together. Let's see. 5 and 1 is 6. 4 and 2 is 6 also. That's 12 plus 3 is 15. You can add them in order, or you can add how I did. It doesn't really make a whole lot of difference. This sum is 15. That's all it's looking for. Right? This one is the sum from i equals 0 to 4 of 2i. So the function that tells me what each number is per element in each set is 2 times whatever i is. So when i is equal to 0, 2 times i is 0. When i is equal to 1, because we increment i by integer values here, when i is equal to 1, 2 times 1 is 2. When i is equal to uh, let's see, I did i equals 0. I'm going to label it like this for you. And then i equals 1. And then i equals 2. I've got to go all the way up to <laughs> 4, which obviously 3 would be the next term. So when i is 2, two time, the function is 2i, so 2 times i is 4. When i is 3, 2 times i is 6. When i is 4, 2 times 4 is 8. So this is telling me to effectively add the even numbers from 2 to 8. So 2 and 8 is 10. 6 and 4 is another 10. That's a total of 20. 
Once you get these written out, there's not much to it, generally. Now, the functions can get more difficult. Uh, but, for instance, this one is asking me to add all the squared numbers from 2 to 6. So when i is equal to 2, that's my starting value, 2 squared is 4. When i is equal to 3, 3 squared is 9. When i is equal to 4, 4 squared is 16. When i is equal to 5, 5 squared is 25. And when i is equal to 6, 6 squared is 36. 6 was my ending value, so that's the last one that I do. Uh, I don't have any particularly great tricks to add these numbers together, um, but there's no say that you can't actually perform this calculation using a calculator. So 4 plus 9 plus 16 plus 25 plus 36. So that's a total of 90. Generally speaking, when you get these written out, the computation isn't all that bad. It's just adding a group of numbers together at that point. But understanding the notation is going to be key to what we do um, throughout this lesson. There are some properties of sums that we should understand. First off, the sum from i equals 1 to n of the constant c is just n times c. Because all that's saying is, uh, let's say we have the sum i equals 1 to 4 of the number 5. This function would evaluate to the number 5 every single time, so you're just doing 5 plus 5 plus 5 plus 5. So that's when i is 1, 2, 3, and then 4, which is effectively just 4 times 5, which is 20. That's all the rule is telling you, is if you just have a constant, you're dealing with multiplication. And it turns out that if you have a constant on any function that can be factored out, that can be completely factored out of the sum altogether, and then just multiply the final resulting sum by that uh, multiple. If you have two distinct functions, you can separate them into two separate summations and then add them up separately. This is an interesting one. It tells us that the sum from i equals 1 to n of the function i is n times n plus 1 divided by 2. So recall back the example that I did a second ago. So if you'll recall from the previous slide here, I had to do the sum from 1 to 5, and I came up with 15. What this rule is telling me is that I could have done it by taking the number of items, which was 5, times uh, the value 6, so 5 times 6, which would have been 30, and then divided the whole thing by 2, which would have been 15. It works out but it might not be entirely obvious as to exactly why it works out. Um, but the, to give you an idea real quickly here, if you, if you reverse the order of all of these terms, so for instance, if I add in the values 5 plus 4 plus 3 plus 2 plus 1, then what happens is there's five groups of the value 6. And so if you take five groups of the value 6, you get the sum of 30. But we don't want to add, the green numbers would have added to 15, the blue numbers would have added to 15. That's double of what we wanted. So you're basically saying that you're going to have n groups of one more than that number, and then you just divide by 2 because of the way it works out. So lastly, we then have the rule that the first sum, uh, or the first squares from 1 to n can be found with the formula n times n plus 1 
times 2n plus 1 divided by 6. Now, let's look at some geometry. What we are eventually working toward is the concept of area. So I want to review area in terms of geometry. And let's look at some basic geometric figures, starting with the rectangle. The rectangle has uh, two basic dimensions, which is the base of the rectangle and the height of the rectangle. Then the area is defined as the base times the height. And the reason the area is the base times the height is because if, let's say we have this measured out and the base is 5 inches and the height is 2 inches, okay? If we want to define area, it makes sense to define area as the number of unit squares that exist within the rectangle. And so if you have 5 inches going one way, I'll try to divide this evenly into 5 groups. Ah, not bad at all, actually. Okay, so then each one of these would be measured as 1 inch. And then I have 5 of those. The height being 2 inches separates all of those into two different regions. But the height of each of those little regions is also 1 inch. So it's a unit measure. So each of these is 1 square inch. And if you add them up, that's going to give you 10 square inches which is the same thing as multiplying 5 times 2. 5 times 2 is 10. Inches times inches makes a square inch. So that's what area is always based off of, the number of unit squares inside a figure. The next one we'll look at is the parallelogram. The area of a parallelogram is found in much the same way that it is with a rectangle. The dimensions that make up uh, the important aspects of a parallelogram, the length of the base, so same thing with a rectangle, and also height. But it's not slant height. So the other side length here is not my height. The height is the difference between the uh, sides of the parallelogram. So this distance here is my height. Now the reason why the area here then is defined as base times height is something that I want you to connect. It is the exact same formula as the area of a rectangle and that is no mistake. In fact, when you multiply any two numbers together Geometrically, you can interpret that as measuring the area of a rectangle. And if you think in those ways, you can really see a lot of the reasons for why we do the things we do in mathematics. Everything you do in algebra, there is something happening geometrically whether or not you see it. But if you make those connections and you see it, you get a much deeper understanding of what's happening. So for instance, why is this the exact same formula as the area of a rectangle if this figure is not a rectangle? Well, the reason is it's not currently a rectangle. You see, if I took this part right here and I cut it out of my figure and moved it over here, well, guess what? That is now going to make a rectangle. The rectangle has two dimensions. The base is still the same, B. The height is still the same, H. And the area of a rectangle is base times height. So the reason that the area of a parallelogram works is because it's basically a rectangle if you move uh, one side of it. Now let's look at a triangle. The area of a triangle, you should know, but if you don't, it's forgivable. It is one half of the base times the height. So we have two important dimensions here, base and height. 
again, if you multiply two numbers together like this, you're measuring the area of a rectangle. So this is just one half of the area of a rectangle, which effectively means that you can transform any triangle into a rectangle. And the way that would be done is if I duplicate this and flip it, and then just move it to where it matches up nicely, like this. Okay, that's pretty good. It may not look like a rectangle, but it's definitely a parallelogram. And the area of a parallelogram is base times height. So if I have the base of the triangle and the height of the triangle, which uh, the height of the triangle um, would technically be this for the parallelogram, but it's actually for the triangle it makes more sense to call it this distance out here. Either way, it's the same length. So you have the height, and then the thing is, base times height, we got from having two of these objects married together. So that's why there's the half there. One half base times height. Now let's look at a trapezoid. So the area of a trapezoid, uh, the formula is a bit more complex. It is one half times h times a plus b. a and b are the lengths of the parallel sides. h is the distance between those sides. Now notice we have one half h times a plus b. It's like we have similar aspects of measuring the area of parallelograms and triangles all in one. And it turns out we really do. You can come up with this with the same sort of argument that we did with the triangle. Invert it, and then move it over here to where it matches up with sides. The top here is now a because I inverted. The bottom is b. The distance between is still h. But notice I've now made a parallelogram. So the two sides of the trapezoid are parallel. Uh, the two opposing sides are, are parallel. So I have a parallelogram. The length of one side is a plus b. The height is still h. And th that would give me the area of this par parallelogram. But then we multiplied the whole thing by 2 because we took another trapezoid that was the same area and put it next to this one. So that's where the area for that comes from. We'll need that in a bit, so just hold on for that. Lastly, we have the circle. The circle, you probably know a little bit about, I'm sure. Uh, we have important dimensions of the radius. And you probably recall that the area of a circle is pi times that radius squared. Most people remember that. If not, again, it's forgivable. But here's the thing. Why? Why is the, the area of pi times r squared? It's simple enough to know. It's an easy thing to memorize. But why on earth is that the case? The reason why is actually one of the fundamental connections between geometry and calculus. And we're going to dive in and explore this and figure it out. We have a situation where we have an object where it doesn't make a whole lot of sense to try and divide this thing up into unit-sized squares. How on earth can we measure the area of a circle that has no sides with a square? It, it doesn't really make a whole lot of sense. We're only going to get an approximation at best. So let's jump into uh, an application that will help us understand this. So we do have some objects that we know how to find the area of. For instance, a triangle. And you can inscribe a triangle into a circle and use that as an approximation to the area of the circle. Now, 
I've picked a circle of radius 3 for no particular reason, and I've inscribed a triangle that is uh, all three sides are the same. There's a formula that you can find the area of this triangle and use it as an approximation. Clearly, that approximation is not going to be very good because look how much area is missing from this figure. So all of this over here would be missing from that approximation. So let's try a different figure. If we increase the number of sides of the inscribed figure, so if I increase it to 4, I have chosen to make it a square instead of a rectangle because things are a little bit more predictable there. Uh, in fact, it's quite easy to come up with the area of this square. The side length of this square, so going this direction here, if the radius is 3, so if this distance right here is 3, uh, this side length right here is 3 times the square root of 2, because this one's also 3. And then that makes a 45, 45, 90 triangle, which you should remember from trig. And if the side length of a 45, 45, 90 triangle, uh, the opposite, the hypotenuse is the side length times the square root of 2. So that's the side length here. If you take that times another dimension, which is also 3 root 2, and multiply them together. Square root of 2 times square root of 2 is 2. 3 times 3 is 9. 9 times 2 is 18. And if you'll notice, this program computed the area as 18. So that's a good approximation to the area of the circle. But again, there is obviously missing regions. But we got a better approximation using a square than we did with a triangle. Let's increase the number of sides again. So if we go up to five sides, that makes a pentagon. Now you can tell that there is less area that's missing. So we're getting a better and a better approximation. And that's the key to calculus, is taking something and getting an approximation for it, getting better at that approximation, and then eventually taking a limit. So going up to eight sides, nine sides, and further, the amount of error in using a polygon inscribed gets smaller and smaller, to the point where if we get enough sides on our polygon, we're going to get about as close as an approximation to the actual area of the circle as we can. So with 100 sides, I've got an area of 28.2557. If we get out the calculator, we know that the area formula is pi times the radius squared, so pi times 9. It's 28.274. So we've gotten really close to the actual area using this uh, process. And if we were to use uh, many, many more sides to this polygon and use the limiting process, we'd eventually come up with the value uh, 9 times 3.14159. And that's how we come up with that area formula. So it's using the limiting process. That's how we connect calculus and geometry together here. Now, we've established formulas for calculating the area of common geometric form, uh, figures. But what about other types of uh, figures that we have? Parabolas, uh, for instance. How do we figure out the area of a parabola? Would we have to always go through some sort of limiting process to come up with that area? And that's essentially what we're trying to establish in uh, this remaining por portion of calculus, is how do we take a generalized curve under a function and try to come up with the area underneath of it? So let's begin with the parabola. We'll have a fu the function f of x equals 4 minus x squared. And we'll try to approximate the area under this curve on the interval from 0 to 2. So 
here's a graph of that function. I'm on an interval from 0 to 2. So starting here, x equals 0, and ending here at x equals 2. So this is the region that I'm interested in. To get this approximation, we're going to use simple geometric figures that we know. Rectangles are the simplest of all the different types of geometric figures that we worked with. That's what we're going to use for our approximations. So part A says approximate the area under this curve with two rectangles. Now we use the x-axis as a baseline just because we have to have some sort of baseline. So the x-axis makes sense. So for instance, if I were to come up with a rectangle that had a base and a height that was somehow dependent upon the function itself, that would give me the approximate area under the curve uh, and between the x-axis. So this little region here would also be included. I should have made sure to shade better. Now, the base of this rectangle, I've chosen to use uh, unit length here. So the base of this rectangle is one unit. The height, notice how I've come up with the height. I've actually used the height of the function at x equals 0. So the height is f of 0. So it's dependent upon the function itself. Right? And I could do that again. I could come up with a, another rectangle right next to it. For instance, right here. And if I figured out the area of this particular rectangle and added it to the rectangle that I already have, that's going to give me the a good approximation to the total area. Notice here when I mentioned that area is defined as the number of square units that exists. If you'll notice here I've got four square units in my first rectangle, three in the next, so the total area here is going to be seven. But we're going to work through the mathematics just to make sure everything works out as planned. The base of each of these is 1. The height on each of them is dependent upon the height of the function at each particular point. So if I want to approximate the area with two rectangles, the approximated area is going to be the area of the first rectangle. There's a base of 1, a height of, actually let me just not get too many parentheses, base of 1, height of f of 0, plus the height of the second rectangle, which is base of 1, the height of the function, at 1. So 1 times f of 0. So if I plug 0 into my function, 4 minus 0 squared is 4. Then f 1 times f of 1. If I plug f 1 into my function, 4 minus 1 is 3. So this is 4 plus 3, which is 7 square units of area. So that's an approximation to the area underneath. But clearly, like with the circle, there's error in this approximation. So this 7 represents an over approximation because this part in red is uh, more than the area that's supposed to be there. So we need to come up with ways of getting a better approximation. The way that we did it with the circle was increasing the number of sides of the polygon. Here, we're going to increase the number of rectangles. So if I do the same example, but increase the number of rectangles to 4, then what's going to happen is the base of each rectangle is going to get smaller. I only have room for a half of a unit for the base of each rectangle. And I'll draw in four of these as best I can, like so. Now, I can get the area 
based off of calculating the height of each of these rectangles. And it's just a matter of doing base times height for each one. And you may be thinking that this area is going to get much larger, but it actually doesn't because I'm decreasing the width of these rectangles. So the area now with four rectangles is going to be the base of the first times the height of that first rectangle. The height of that first rectangle is uh, the function evaluated at zero. The second rectangle is a base of one half again, but the height of that rectangle is the function evaluated at one half. The third rectangle has a base of one half. Its height uh, is dependent upon the function evaluated at one. And then that fourth rectangle is one half times f of 3 halves. So adding these together, multiplying out, I'm going to get a, another approximation. f of 0, since uh, the function is 4 minus x squared, f of 0 is still 4, so 1 half times 4 for the first. And then the second one is 1 half times f of 1 half. Well, f of 1 half is a little trickier to calculate, but let's see. So 4 minus 1 half squared. 4 minus 1 half squared would be 4 minus a quarter, which would be 4 minus a quarter. If I get the common denominators, 4, 16, so that would be uh, 15 fourths. And then f of 1, this would be 1 half times 4 minus 1 squared, which is 3, plus 1 half of f of 3 halves. Again, i got to do a little bit of work with fractions. So 4 minus, so 3 halves squared would be 9 fourths. So this would be 16 fourths minus 9 fourths, which is uh, 16 minus 9 should be 7 fourths. Okay, so 1 half times 4 is 2 plus 15 eighths plus 3 halves plus 7 eighths. And you know what? I'm just going to use a calculator to get an approximation with a decimal here. So 2 plus 15 eighths plus 3 halves plus 7 eighths. So 6.25. This approximation is smaller than what we had before. Uh, and it turns out that it's actually a better approximation. It's closer to the actual area because this area in red is smaller than the area that would have been in red in the previous example. Because the area in red from the previous example would have also included this portion and this portion. So we knocked that amount out by decreasing the number of rectangles. So we've got a better approximation. And if we continue to add more rectangles to this figure, we're going to get a better and better approximation. And that's the point. That's the idea of where the limiting process comes in. That's where the calculus comes in and connects these ideas between geometry and calculus. Now the uh, way that we went about calculating this approximation, we used what are called left end point triangles. We could have used other variations. We could use right end point triangles, midpoint triangles. There's different variations here that will work. But regardless of the type of approximation chosen, we always get a better estimate by increasing the number of rectangles. Then when we take a limit, we arrive at the exact area under the curve. That's what we're going to work toward. But I want you to see this visually to get an idea of what's going on. So let's open up an, uh, an application here to see it. So here's a 
function that's a little bit more complex and I wanted to use one that's slightly different because it has different intervals of concavity because different things happen with concavity. But right here I'm calculating the area under the curve between negative 4 and 3 and you can see left endpoint triangles uh, you've got a certain amount of error on each one of these triangles some of this error is under approximation some of it is over approximation and that cancels out and so we actually probably have a pretty decent approximation to the actual area under the curve here with just a few number of rectangles because of that cancellation but regardless if we increase the number of rectangles so if I go up to seven rectangles then what happens is the amount of over approximation and under approximation gets better and better and then increasing the number of rectangles makes it more difficult to do the calculation because there's a lot more areas that you have to add up but increasing the number of rectangles decreases the amount of error to the point where you can actually get a very good approximation of the area under the curve. Now, as I mentioned, we used left endpoint rectangles. There's also variations such as right endpoint rectangles, which just uses uh, the, the right endpoint here to calculate the height of the curve. Not a big difference. Um, you still get under approximations and over approximations. Same things happen here. There's also variations like midpoint rectangles. So you use the middle of your interval to get the height of the rectangle instead. And the idea there is you have a little bit of over approximation and under approximation per interval so that your approximation would be better per uh, smaller number of rectangles. You can also do a variation where you're always using lower endpoint rectangles and therefore always getting an under approximation or even upper rectangles where you're always getting an over approximation. There's lots of different methods of doing this but regardless of how you choose you can always get a better and better approximation by increasing the number of rectangles altogether. Now we are going to work into the definition of what's known as a definite integral. So if f is defined on a closed interval from a to b and the limit, uh, the limit defined here, we read this as the limit as the norm of the intervals goes to zero. The norm of the intervals just means the width of the rectangles goes to zero. So ignore the notation. I'll it'll make sense as we go through. So as the limit as the width of our rectangles go to zero of the sum of the area of those rectangles so notice here this is two numbers multiplied this is a height delta x is working as a base so this is an area of a rectangle and add up all these sub rectangles and that gives us the approximate area of the entire fig or the entire area under the curve all right so if this limit exists then f is integrable on the interval from a to b and the limit is denoted by the integral from a to b of f of x dx it's no mistake that we're using the symbol for uh, antiderivatives here. It's no mistake that we said earlier that the we sometimes interchange the concept of uh, the antiderivative and the integral. We'll make all those connections uh, as we continue our study here. But the one thing we did say is that the antiderivative symbol symbol looks like a, an elongated s and that's because it's related to the symbol sigma which is also related to the it's the Greek letter closest to s so 
is related to a sum, and that's kind of just connected through the mathematics here. But this is how we denote uh, a definite integral, and it represents the actual area under a curve, f of x, on the interval from a to b. Let's take a look at an example of calculating the area under a curve of a relatively simple function, 2x dx. Now, we are going to do this uh, in a way that connects all of the ideas between geometry and calculus. Some of you may be familiar with more advanced techniques at this point, and we will get to those. But we haven't fully connected all of our ideas yet, and we're not going to use those ideas until we do so. So when I calculate this integral, I'm going to do so from a limit. Now, the way we're going to do this is we're going to define the area under the curve 2x on the interval from 1 to 2 as the limit, as the norm of my partitions goes to 0 of the sum of i equals 1 to n f of c sub i times delta x sub i. So this is going to be the height of a rectangle times the width of a rectangle, and we add all those together up for a certain number of rectangles to get an approximation. We repeat this process over and over, and we take a limit uh, as the uh, norm of those partitions goes to 0. So couple of things here. Delta x, there is a very easy way of defining delta x. So it's going to be the width of our interval divided by the number of rectangles that we want to use. We'll leave that as a constant like that instead of recalculating it for different points. So Whatever the width of our interval is divided by the number of rectangles, that's what delta x is always going to be. Now, on our interval, oh, I said from 1 to 2. I'm sorry, this is from 1 to 5. I don't know where I got that. Da. Let me fix it. 1 to 5, 2x, dx. Okay. Now, the thing is, the endpoints of our interval is not going to change. This is the lower endpoint of our interval, which is a. This is the upper endpoint of our interval, which is b. So b minus a is always going to be 5 minus 1, which is 4. So no matter how many uh, subintervals, how many rectangles we want to use, that is, uh, delta x will always be 4 divided by the number of rectangles we want to use. c sub i, we're going to use as the right end point of each subinterval. And I'm choosing right end points here because we could use left end points or midpoints. It's just sometimes right end points are a little bit easier to calculate in general. No big deal. So what that means is c sub i, so the right end point of each rectangle in my interval, is going to be the starting point of my interval plus i times however wide each one of those rectangles is. So in this particular case, a is a constant 1, delta x is 4 over n, so this is just going to be 1 plus 4i over n. That will tell me exactly where the right end point of each one of my rectangles is. Okay, so now the definite integral from 1 to 5, 2x dx. This is the limit of the norm of my partitions 
and we're going to handle that in a second. I know that's probably a little confusing at this point, but the norm of the partitions of the sum from i equals 1 to n, f of 1 plus 4i over n, because it was f of c sub i, so I t t came up with something better for c sub i, and I've also got something better for delta x. It's just 4 over n. So this is a height of a rectangle times a base of a rectangle. Okay. Now, this is going to be equivalent to allowing, whoops, a limit, sorry. The limit as n goes to infinity. So n is the number of rectangles. So the norm of my partitions, the width of those rectangles, that is, is going to go to 0 when I increase the number of rectangles to infinity. So this is an equivalent statement for my limit, but makes a little bit more sense. So my limit as n goes to infinity of the sum from i equals 1 to n. Now it's the function evaluated at 1 plus 4i over n. But my function is just 2x, so 2 times whatever uh, the input value is. So it's effectively 2 times 1 plus 4i over n times my delta x, which is 4 over n. And anything I can simplify at this point is a good thing to do. So for instance, um, I have my limit as n goes to infinity. Notice 2 and 4 are uh, constant values. You can pull constant values out of a sum. We talked about that earlier in this lesson. And actually, n itself is a constant value with respect to this sum, because i is the thing that's changing, n is the number of rectangles. That's changing with the limit, but not with the sum. So I can actually take 8 over n out of that sum, And that simplifies things quite a bit. OK, now, this then could be the limit as n goes to infinity of 8 over n. The sum of two things added could be split up into two separate sums. That was a property that we described. And look at the first one. It's just the sum of 1 over and over and over again. So that, in fact, is just simply 1 times n. So we can get rid of this entire summation, because the sum of i equals 1 to n of 1 is just 1 times n, which is n. And 4 over n is a constant with respect to this sum. So I can pull that out. And now look what we have. A lot of writing between each step here. So 8 over n, this is n plus. So I have 4 over n times the sum from 1 to n of just i. We had a formula for determining that. The formula from 1 to n of i is n times n plus 1 divided by 2. That's really nice, because now we've gotten rid of all of those summations, because those were not looking very nice. If You might disagree with me, but I think it's looking a lot better. 4 goes into 2 twice, n cancels n, so now we have the limit as n goes to infinity of 8 over n times, it's now n plus 2 
times n plus 1, which is the limit as n goes to infinity, 8 over n times, this is going to be 3n plus 2. If I multiply in that 8n, I've got, it looks like, 24, because 8 times 3 is 24, n over n cancels, plus 16 over n. And now if I let n go to 0, 16 over n, I'm sorry, if I let n go to infinity, 16 over n goes to 0, which means my limit here is 24. So the total area under the curve from 1 to 5 of the function 2x is 24. And let's make sure that makes sense. I picked a very simple example. <laughs> you may disagree with how long it took us to do this. But let me rest assured here, this is probably the last time you're going to see one done with a limit. Um, we'll get more advanced methods as we go along. But here, I have picked a very simple function, which was 2x. And I have that graphed right here. So y equals 2x. That's a line. So on the interval from 1 to 5, so on the interval starting here, so from 1 to here, which is 5, what I'm trying to do is come up with the area of this region. Now, it looks triangular, but it's actually more like a trapezoid. And the base of this trapezoid is 4. This side length is 1. This side length would be, no, I'm sorry, the scale is off. So the scale the length there is 2. The length of this other side is 10. The area of a trapezoid, we said, was 1 half of the height times the sum of the two sides. So 1 half, the height is the distance between the two sides, so that's my 4. And then the side lengths are 2 and 10. So 2 plus 10, whoops, not 2 plus 12, 2 plus 10, which is 12. 4 over 2 is 2, 2 plus 10 is 12, 2 times 12 is 24. So we've actually proven here that this works out uh, using rectangular approximations. Uh, we get the exact area under the curve. Clearly, using a geometric formula was easier here, but we don't have a geometric formula for every single type of curve. So this limiting process will allow us to calculate the area under any kind of curve uh, that we can come up with. So now we're going to look at some properties of definite integrals. And as we go through each one, I'm going to show you visually how each one works out, because these make a whole lot of sense when you combine them with the idea that definite integrals are just uh, areas under a p particular curve. So beginning with the first property of definite integrals, and in that the definite integral from a to the same value a of a function f of x dx is 0. To see why this is true, if we take a look at this app, which takes uh, a defined function, and for that particular function, I can change the bounds on the integral and calculate the total amount of area underneath the curve. So let's say, for instance, I want to calculate the area from uh, 1 to 1.5. Then this shaded region would now represent the area underneath this curve from 1 to 1.5. But if I make this the area from 1 to 1, there is no space for area to exist. So the integral of that, or the definite integral, is going to evaluate to 0. The next property is that the definite integral from a to b of f of x dx is the negative of the definite integral from b to a of f of x dx. 
And the way we can see that is if I set my start and end point from uh, 1 to 1 1.5, there's a total amount of area under the curve between those two points. If I swap those values, then effectively what happens is my delta x's get reversed in the calculation, and the value of the integral becomes negative because that delta x, which is a multiplier of the width of the rectangles that I use as an approximation, the width of those rectangles becomes a negative number, and therefore the total area becomes a negative number. It's the same value, so I've got negative 1.4085 here. If I swap them back around, it's still, well, if I can get it on there, it's kind of hard sometimes. Um, approximately the same thing. So it's the same value, just reversed in sign. The next property is that the definite integral of a to b of f of x dx is equal to the definite integral of a to c of f of x dx plus c to b of f of x dx provided c is between a and b. Let me show you what that means. So what this rule is telling me is that if I calculate, say, the area from 0 to 1 and then 1 to 2 uh, separately, then that's going to give me a total area under the curve, which I could add together and come up with by, which I could get by using the calculator. So 2.1667 plus 3.1667. So that gives me a total of 5.3334. So what the rule is telling me, though, is that uh, let's say I push this green area off to the side. Now, if I extend the blue area to where it goes all the way over to 2, so from 0 to 2, then the total amount of area for the blue area is 5.3333, the sum of the original blue and green areas. So this rule just tells me that I can add areas together as long as they're not overlapping. The next rule is the interval integral from a to b of k times f of x dx equals k times the integral of f of x dx. This one's not so easy to see for generalized functions, but if I set a function that is constant, so what this rule is telling me is that the total area under the curve, say from 0 to 2, for each of these functions gets doubled. And that's really e easy to see here for a uh, region that is rectangular, but it does work for any other type of region as well. Just if you double uh, your function, you get double the area or whatever scale value you put on your function, you get that scale of area. Next, we have the integral from a to b of f of x plus or minus g of x dx is the integral of f of from a to b of f of x dx plus or minus the integral of a to b g of x dx. This right here isn't quite so easy to see visually, but it is based off of our limits in that limits we had a summation and difference property and same thing was true for derivatives so it should make sense that we have this same property for integrals as well it's just not going to be quite as easy to see that this is true visually so I'll leave that one alone but um, it is true The next thing we have to talk about is what's known as the trapezoidal rule. So it's possible that at this point, you've probably already asked yourself back earlier in the video, when we were doing approximations, why did we restrict ourselves to only using rectangles? Why didn't we use different types of shapes to match the curves better? Because curves naturally aren't going to be lending themselves very well to rectangular 
uh, approximations. It just so happens that when you allow those rectangles widths to go to zero, it doesn't really make any difference what shape the uh, approximation is. But if you want to get a better approximation using fewer appro approximating rectangles or whatever shape you choose, trapezoidal rule actually makes a whole lot of sense. So it's only used in approximations because again, it doesn't matter when you finally get to an infinite number of these things. It doesn't matter which shape you use. Um, to get an understanding here, let's open up an app so you can see. Here is the same function that we were using earlier in the video. This we started off with left endpoint rectangles and the value of the integral, the definite integral, if I actually calculated the area under the curve is 42.09. So notice right now with my left endpoints I have four rectangles. My left endpoint approximation is 40.61 which is somewhat below uh, what it needs to be. If we switch and use the trapezoidal rule, the trapezoidal rule now that's a using lines at the top of here instead of rectangles and making the shape of a trapezoid, that actually gives us a better approximation with fewer uh, approximating shapes. So 41.84 is a better approximation than we had with, uh, with using rectangles. Now, um, you can take this further. There is uh, another rule called Simpson's rule. We're not going to study Simpson's rule, but I want you to see that it could be done. So the idea in Simpson's rule is why even use uh, linear shapes to represent approximations to curves when you could use curves like parabolas. And so the idea with uh, Simpson's rule is to use parabolas instead because even with the, just a small number of parabolas, you can get a very good approximation to what the area under that curve is going to be. And if your job is to make an approximation, that's really helpful. So let's take a look at how the trapezoidal rule is set up because you may be asked at some point to actually evaluate one through. So the trapezoidal rule, let's suppose we have some function f of x. And we want to find uh, an approximation to the area under the curve of f of x between a and b. So between these points here. If we use, uh, let's just say, four trapezoids, then we would still need to find the height of the function at these particular points. And they would be evenly spaced as we, if we were actually doing these. Oops, I didn't mean to draw that dot there. I meant to draw it here at where A is. And what we would do then is use these two points to connect for one side of a trapezoid. These are the opposing sides. And this is the other side of the trapezoid. So my trapezoid actually looks a little bit funny. It looks like this. So we have this shape like that. These two are always going to be right angles because of the way they're connecting to the x-axis. However, the us trapezoid are not going to be right angles. We will use the distance along the bottom as delta x. That won't change. But the height of one side would be my function evaluated at uh, some subinterval. I'll call this i plus 1. And then this side over here, f of x sub i. So we can get the heights of both sides of the trapezoid, which is important because uh, in order to get the area of a trapezoid, those are the different things that we need. So um, the area of a trapezoid, we learned earlier, was 1 half, 
of the base. At the, actually, we called that. So the area of a trapezoid we learned from earlier is one half of its height, and that's the difference between the the distance between the two sides, times the sum of the two sides. So in this case, this figure, we would have one half. The distance between the two sides is delta x. The height of one side would be f of x sub i. The height of the other side would be f of x sub i plus 1. And that would give me the area of a subinterval. And what we would need to do then is add up all the uh, individual subintervals. So what ends up happening, and I'm not going to go into all the detail here, but what ends up happening is um, I end up calculating the height of the curve uh, for one side of this, tra this trapezoid at f sub a, the first subinterval. And then I need the other side of this trapezoid for the completion of that. Then when I move to the next trapezoid, I need this side again, and then the height of the next trapezoid. So this interval here, here, and here get computed twice. But the end point ones only get computed once. So when we look at the formula for the trapezoidal rule, here's what it looks like. So uh, the area is going to be b minus a over 2n. This comes from taking delta x over 2, uh, just right here from my area formula for uh, one of the trapezoids. Because remember, delta x is b minus a divided by the number of trapezoids that we want to use. So that's what that term comes from. And then it is f of x sub 0 plus 2 times f of x sub 1 plus 2 times f of x sub 2 plus that keeps occurring until the next to last one, which would be 2 times f of x sub n minus 1, plus the last one, which is f sub b. There's just one of those sides, so f of x sub n. And that's how we come up with the rule for the trapezoidal rule. Let's take a look at an example of its usage. Approximate the area under the curve y, four, y equals 4 minus x squared on the interval from 0 to 2 using four trapezoids. Okay? So the, if we're going from 0 to 2 using four trapezoids, we have to evenly space those. And so my uh, delta x is going to be b minus a divided by the number of trapezoids we want to use, or 1 half. So the distance between each trapezoid is 1 half unit. All right, so we're going to get the height of the curve at each point and calculate the area of that trapezoid. Then we'll get this height and this height, calculate the area of this trapezoid and so forth. So looking at this curve, we should actually get a pretty decent approximation to the area under here, even with just four trapezoids. And that's the point, to get a better approximation with fewer approximating shapes. OK, so according to the trapezoidal rule, the area is b minus a divided by 2n, so 2 times 4 times f of x sub 1, so we start at 0, then plus 2 times f of x sub 1, so we go, uh, let me just say this point right here is 
uh, x sub 0, sorry. This next one in line is x sub 1, which is at a half of a unit, so f of 1 half. So we just increase by delta x. Plus 2 times f of 1, plus 2 times f of 3 halves, plus f of 2. And we just need to evaluate each of these separately. So 2 minus, that's not supposed to be an a, that's supposed to be 0, because uh, my value of a was 0. So 2 minus 0 is 2, divided by 8 is 1 fourth. The function evaluated at 0 is 4. And the function evaluated at 1 half, uh, you can do on your own. When you take that and you multiply it by 2, it becomes 15 halves. 2 times the function evaluated at 1, you can do that on your own, but that's going to be uh, 6. 2 times the function evaluated at 3 halves will be 7 halves. And f of 2 actually results in 0, so then plus 0. When you work through all of these fractions, get common denominators, um, we end up with 1 fourth times 42 over 2, which would be uh, 21 over 4, which is approximately 5.25. And that's a pretty decent approximation to the area under the curve, given that we've only got four approximating uh, objects here, because the actual area under the curve is uh, 5 and a third, which is 5.333. So it's a very decent approximation, even with just a few approximating terms.